Oh, just just hang up. Just hang up. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Live to 110 podcast. Uh, sorry, we had a couple of technical difficulties. That's okay. We're going to get Lier here on the air in just one second. And again, today I'm going to be interviewing Lier Keith. I'm very, very excited about this show. Um, I've been anticipating her coming on the show for a while because I myself used to be vegetarian. And when I read her book, I it completely changed my life and I changed my diet because I realized that a lot of the ideas I had about vegetarianism were not, in fact, correct. Um, so we're broadcasting live from Malibu, California. And uh, before we get started, I have to do a little disclaimer. Please keep in mind that this program is not intended to diagnose or treat any disease or health condition. The Live to 110 podcast is solely informational in nature and is not intended to diagnose, cure, or heal any disease. So please consult your healthcare practitioner before attempting any treatment I or a guest on this show suggest. So please go check out my website, live to 110com I started the site to educate you about paleo nutrition and the importance of detoxing from heavy metals and industrial chemicals that are the major underlying cause of disease and how to treat your health conditions naturally without medication. And if you like what you hear today in today's show, please give the Live to 110 podcast a nice review and rating in iTunes. This is going to help me uh, get my message to people around the world to get my word out on health, and I would appreciate it so much. So let's get on with the show. I wanted to tell you my, my thankfully short ordeal with the vegetarian and vegan diet. I was vegetarian for 18 months and then took the plunge with a vegan diet for six months. And after I read the China study, uh, that was it. It gave me the concrete proof I needed to go vegan and stop eating all animal products, including meat and dairy. And after a couple of years, I began, I began having very subtle health problems. I was experiencing brain fog and mental instability. I was actually going into rages here and there. I was having depression and fatigue, and I hadn't slept well in years. And luckily, I was fortunate enough to seek help with my doctor when I began sensing that just something wasn't quite right in my body. Um, but frankly, I sought out the doctor when I started having trouble losing weight <laughs> because little did I know that my vegan diet killed my thyroid, which killed my metabolism. And, you know, my doctor ran all the tests, but she didn't really know or didn't tell me that my diet was the issue. But luckily, I happened to be reading Natasha Campbell McBride's Gut and Psychology Syndrome at the same time I got my test results. And there was a chapter in the book on the nutrient deficiencies suffered when you're on a vegetarian diet. And I was literally reading my test results. And at that moment, it dawned on me that my diet was causing my health problems. You know, but I was still hesitant. I needed more proof because all the research I'd read that the vegetarian diet was healthy was programmed in my brain. And uh, Dr. Campbell McBride's book it, it kept referring to Lear Keith's book, The Vegetarian Myth. And I cannot even tell you how thankful I am that I read this book because it gave me a, the very clear message backed by real research that I needed to hear that the vegan diet does not promote health as it claims. And I'm so excited to have the author of this book that saved my health on the show. And good afternoon, Lear. How are you? Lear, are you there? Hello. Hello, Leah. Are you there? Hi. Oh, hi. I'm so sorry. I had you on mute. <laughs> I couldn't tell. Um, how are you doing? Lots of technical I'm difficulties. I'm good. How are you? Today. That's okay. It That's happens. okay. We worked it out. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm so glad you're here. So uh, first, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and what you what inspired you to write The Vegetarian Myth? Well, I um, I was a vegan for almost 20 years. I started when I was 16, and um, as you might guess, uh, my health failed catastrophically. And I think uh, two reasons that I wrote the book. One is that I really did want to save the next generation of idealistic young people from doing this to themselves because it's pointless. Um, and I also want the people who care the most about animals and about the planet to understand that a vegan diet is not the best embodiment of those values. Uh, we think it is because we don't have complete information, but when you add more information into 
the package, you start to realize that the problems are way bigger and the solutions are also very different than simply eating a plant-based diet. So those were sort of uh, my two my two biggest motivations in writing the book. Yeah, it's really just amazingly written, and it's hard to it's hard to you know make arguments against what you're saying because you say it so eloquently and so clearly. Um, but Thank when you. was your light bulb moment when you stopped being vegan? Well, honestly, the light bulb moment was the very last day of my vegan life. Um, I would say, you know, most of my friends were also either vegetarian or vegan. I mean, it was just what you did if you were, you know, any kind of a environmentalist or a feminist or whatever, activist. You know, everybody was a vegetarian, and we were all trying to be vegan as well. And I was more successful than everybody else in my friendship circle. I mean, I was the one who was known for being really hardcore. And I say that because all of my friends one by one fell away. They all started developing health problems. Um, some of them sooner rather than later. Some of us really stuck it out. But um, So I had watched any number of people in my life already tell me that they had to eat meat or they felt incredibly sick in various ways. And I didn't believe them, frankly. It was too hard to believe them. Uh, it meant that everything that, you know, I had built this whole ideology and really an identity around being vegan, and it was almost impossible for me to hear my friend say, um, you know, I just feel too sick eating this way and I feel dramatically better when I eat you know, fill in the blank. And so I was the last one in my friendship circle to really give it up. Um, and it, it helped having seen other people already go through it. Um, but I sort of knew it was coming. You know, I knew eventually it was going to have to be me. But, I, you know, it's really hard to face that um, when you have built your identity around, you know, this whole set of ideas and this whole way of life. So the very last day of my vegan life, I went to see a Qigong healer as a traditional Chinese medicine form of traditional Chinese medicine, and he told me point blank that if I kept doing this, I was going to die. And I knew he was right. I knew that I, ju I just could not go on with the level of pain and exhaustion that I was dealing with. So it was really hard. Um, this is not an easy moment for anybody. Um, you know, there's a lot of people out there who say, oh, you're just doing this because you like the taste of meat or something, you know, as if it's just some kind of preference, and it wasn't. It was an incredibly traumatic thing to have to learn to eat meat again. But the results were instantaneous in my case. So I knew he was right, um, and I was glad that he told me the truth. And in my case, I really had to hear it from somebody who who I really respected and who had more knowledge and more status than I did. I couldn't hear it from my peers. It wasn't enough. But when this 70-year-old Qigong healer, you know, who's been doing this his whole life, basically took one look at me and said, you're going to kill yourself, um, that was the moment when I was able to finally hear. And, and I knew he was right. I mean, that had already been building up. Like, I knew that that, I had a feeling that was what I was headed for when I went in that day, but it was still a really, really hard moment, and I cried a lot, and he was incredibly compassionate toward me, um, but, you know, it had to be done. So, yes, I'm dramatically healthier now than I was in 1999, and I'm very, very grateful that I um, listened to his advice. So, that was the end. It's a very hard day for everyone, and there are plenty of people who send me email every week who are at exactly that moment in their lives, and... I try to give them that same compassion and care because I know how hard it is to take that first bite when you haven't done it for 5 or 10 or 15 years. It's a really hard thing to get over. Um, you know, once you've built up all this resistance to it, it, it's really a hard thing. It's not just diet, you know. It's like everything. So um, anyway, yeah, that's that's where it was. <laughs> well, what health problems did you suffer when you were a vegan? Well, I after about two years of being vegan, my spine started to fall apart. I have degenerative disc disease. People's spines don't fall apart for no reason when they're 18. Um, it was a complete anom anomaly. None of the doctors could figure out what the hell was wrong with me or why this was happening. Um, and when you look at my MRI, they assume I was in some kind of horrible car accident or that I had a skydiving accident. That's what it looks like. That's how bad it is. And the pain, you know, was just extraordinary. Um, so there was that that nobody could explain. Um, I stopped menstruating, which, of course, is very common among women who are either vegan or eat other kinds of low-fat diets. Um, the hypoglycemia just got worse and worse and worse. Um, I also developed an autoimmune disease. I have Hashimoto's, which was not diagnosed for years and years, but that clearly has a link to both soy and wheat, wheat consumption, so I didn't do myself any favors with that. Um, you know, then I had this sort of usual low-grade stuff that a lot, a lot of vegans get, so the horrible dry skin, the dry hair, um, the tremendous exhaustion, freezing cold all the time. I mean, all of that is part of Hashimoto's as well, but it sort of comes as a package. And then the terrible depression 
and anxiety stuff that just got worse and worse. And it wasn't until I got out of, you know, vegan world and started to really investigate more about nutrition that all of that fell into place, that I realized what I had done to myself and that some of that was going to be permanent. Um, some things did get better. I mean, some of this cleared up right away, but some of it I will live with forever. So that's just the price you pay for, you know, doing crazy idealistic things when you're a teenager. Yeah. <laughs> some of us uh-huh. have regrets. So, yeah. Uh, uh, and, you know, many vegans and vegetarians claim that, you know, gorillas are big and strong yet eat only plants. So what are your thoughts on this concept? That's a very common argument. Well, gorillas have a completely different digestive system than we do. So, yeah, they're big and strong, so are elephants. But, you know, we can't eat cellulose and turn it into usable fat and protein. They can. So, you know, if I had the digestion of a gorilla, sure, I could eat bark and leaves, but I'm not. So, you know, you'll starve on that diet. You'll kill yourself. There's, you cannot extract nutrition from it um, because our digestive system is completely different. I mean, our digestive system looks much more like a wolf than it ever will a gorilla. Yeah. You know, and I have to say, I, I really credit your book with snapping me out of my vegan haze and and think so many and you know rethink so many dietary lies I've been fed within the vegan community and by the China study. And what are your thoughts on the China study? The China study, right? Um, you know, the best takedown of the China study is actually Denise Minger, and I cannot possibly do the kind of job on the China study that she did. And I would highly recommend everybody go and she's pages and pages. I mean, she spent three months. Um, just reading the China study and figuring out all kinds of things that were wrong with it. So some of the big problems with the China study, I'll try to be really brief, but, um, you know, like one problem with these kinds of studies is that they take these broad populations and then, you know, you, you try to reduce the variables to one thing, and it really can't be done. So, for instance, you know, you'd say, oh, there's some kind of causality between the fact that these people have, you know, less kidney cancer, and what do you know, they eat this or this or this. And there's no way that you can make a causal, you know, argument between this one thing in their diet and the fact that they may have more or less cancer. Um, and the, so those kinds of studies are, are kind of useless. Um, they can sort of point you in, in some broad directions, but in order to, to draw any kind of conclusion from that, you'd have to isolate every single one of those va- variables and then actually do a study in a laboratory setting. And the China study is mostly that kind of broad-based silliness that, that does not actually tell us anything useful about the variables at work and what they may or may not produce in actual human beings. So that's like sort of, you know, in broad strokes what's going on. Um, but, you know, he also, he does some some very, some real sleight-of-hand stuff, like this this whole thing about, well, if you feed rats certain proteins, then, you know, they may or may not get cancer. And, you know, the point is that those proteins don't ever exist in isolation in nature. So you're taking basically highly industrial, highly industrialized extracts of food, feeding them to rats, and then seeing if it causes cancer. Well, we already know that's going to cause cancer. And that doesn't exist in nature. Like, why would that make a healthy rat? So he's not really proving anything that we don't already know, because um, that's never going to happen in the real world, Right. Um, you know, we don't eat isolated proteins, isolated amino acids in, in nature. We eat full whatever it is we eat, whether it's meat or whether it's plants. You know, it comes with a whole co- cohort of different amino acids. So he's testing something that's never going to happen. Um, so that's, like, another big problem with it. Um, and, you know, overall, I just I, – it's this. I mean, the China study was not a peer-reviewed study for that reason. None of this actually is how science is done. And a lot of people read it as if that's true, but they don't understand what science is, how an experiment is actually set up, and then, you know, what you may or may not draw from it. They think that because there may be some correlate, correlations made, that somehow that's causality, and it, it simply isn't true. I mean, that's not how that's not how it works in science. So I would really recommend that people do a little more research, a little more reading into the China study and all its problems, and really try to understand what the scientific method is and how scientists actually do science, because you'll see that Colin Campbell doesn't really stack up to any of that. Yeah, and I I don't mean to keep harping about it, but, you know, whenever I talk to someone who's vegetarian or vegan, their go-back is always the China study, but it's been refuted by, you know, scientists that aren't even in the nutrition world that's just refuted on bad science grounds. 
And, um, you know, and the basis of my conversion to veganism was to save my health, you know, so I, I could prevent all the dreaded diseases from which our country suffers. And do you think the vegan diet is the way to prevent disease, as the China study claims? No, um, very firmly no. <laughs> the problem with the vegan diet is that, well, there's two problems. One is that there are some substances that are you're going to get too many of those things, and then there's the deficiencies. There's some nutrition nutritional substances you need that you're never going to get, or never going to get enough of. So you've got excess, and then you've got deficiency, and neither of those are going to meet the needs of the human template. So I can get into specifics if you want, but just broadly speaking, that's the problem with the vegan diet. You've got excess, and you've got deficiency both. Yeah. And, and it really saddens me that many of the top selling books on Amazon are books promoting the vegan diet by Joel Furman, <clears throat> Neil Bernard, John Robbins, and others. And uh, why do you think the vegan diet is becoming so popular? I mean, it's such a joyless diet, and there's so many restrictions, so many things you can't eat, yet people are somehow drawn to this way of eating. Uh, why do you think this is? And you know, are these books just playing on people's fears of avoiding disease? I think part of it is the disease factor. I'm speaking for myself. The, one of the main reasons I did it was because I felt once I learned about factory farming, uh, it was really horrifying, and I didn't want anything to do with it. And I didn't know there were any other options. Also, being 16-year-old and living in the suburbs, I didn't actually have any options. I mean, I had no way to get to a real farm or to grow my own food. So all I knew was that, you know, if you're eating animal products, you're eating a pile of torture. And that is generally true if you're eating factory farming. And I, I think everybody, no matter what side of this debate you're on, I think that's one conclusion we can at least all agree to, that factory farming is really horrible and we need to stop it. And so that, at least, I think we can set aside. Yes, that's true. So then the question becomes, um, you know, what else is it that we are trying to avoid or trying to promote? And for me, you know, the animal cruelty thing was huge but also just death. You know, I thought that there was a way for my body, for my life to exist without the death of sentient creatures. And it seemed really obvious to me that when I looked at my dinner plate, there was either a dead thing or there was a pile of, you know, insensate salads, essentially. So animals mattered and plants didn't. And that was the line I was going to draw. So if death was really the question, if the suffering of sentient beings was the problem, then it seemed... The, the really the simple way to do that was simply to eat plants instead. Now, there's a few problems with this. The first one being that agriculture is the most destructive thing people have done to the planet. I mean, literally, the number one thing. Um, so you can't, there's no way you can look at the history of this and say wiping out 98% of animals' habitat is somehow animal-friendly. It's, I mean, it's, it's just that's absurd. But I didn't know that at the time. So all I knew was that is there something dead on your plate? Um, it's not until you dig a little deeper and try to figure out, well, how is my food actually produced? What is the cost to the planet? And you start to question agriculture. That's when you start to get to the deeper answers, okay, because it's way bigger than, you know, what looks like it's done on your plate. And the other problem with this, even setting aside the agriculture problem, um, is that plants are extremely sentient. They are intelligent. They communicate. They help each other. They work in communities. They communicate in a slightly different way than we do, but... They are very much alive and very much participating. And, in fact, we owe our lives to them. I mean, they're the ones who create oxygen for us, right? I mean, we'd be dead, you know, in, in what, six minutes without oxygen? Um, and that's, what they, that's one of the things they do for us. They also have a whole bunch of other functions in terms of keeping the planet alive, keeping all the different cycles going, the nitrogen cycle and the water cycle and all of that, very dependent on plants. But if you don't know that, right, then the simple answer is, oh, if I want to stay away from death and suffering – I shouldn't eat animals. So that was what I did when I was 16, and it, it very, to me, it very much matched the psychology that that adolescents tend to have, which is that very black and white thinking. And you know, the, I think the gift of adolescence, of course, is is that incredible moral vigor. It mattered to me so intensely not to participate in factory farming once I found out about it, and that's commendable. That's not something that you know. That's not something that, that's not the problem. You know, the problem is not the, the, what the, the underlying ethics here, the underlying value system. The problem is that there's much bigger information that we need to incorporate in before we make these decisions. So I think that one of the reasons that these books are so big is um, 
because I think a lot of people care about what's happening to animals and to the planet, and they've been told this is the simplest solution. That's not the solution that we need, but, I mean, I, I, I think it's good that at least people are, are trying to think about food and, um, you know, human entitlement in a, in a more political way. So that's the good part of this. The bad part is that they've been led astray completely, and they are just going to – they're not helping the planet at all, and they are definitely going to damage their health long term. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, I was really shocked when I read in your book that you're actually killing animals even if you only eat plants. And I thought that was just so brilliant. And th- can you explain what you mean by this statement? Well, there's two different levels here. The first is that, and I, I mean, I discovered this being a gardener, that I could not have healthy soil without adding animal products. Um, the soil just wears out. There's no nitrogen, all the minerals. Wear, they call it mining the soil because you're sucking all the minerals out and there's no way to replace them. Um, without adding animal products. And so, you know, I could go to the feed store, to the garden store, and buy something that says, you know, organic, you know, soil amendment and not read the label. But I'm not that kind of person. So, of course, I read the labels. And what you're adding back is, of course, blood meal and bone meal. It's dead animals because that's what plants eat. I mean, there's not actually any way out of the cycle. And that was the hardest part for me, you know. And, and at the end, what I had to accept was that they were just, there were two kinds of death. There was no death-free option for me to be alive. I was going to be dependent on death no matter what. And so the first option was I could be part of that cycle of life. So life becomes death, becomes life, becomes death, and we are all eating each other in the end. And I could be a, a, a willful and conscious part of that process and do it the best way that I knew how. Or I could be part of the death that's killing everything. And my conclusion on that was that that was agriculture that this process of taking over entire ecosystems, destroying every living thing, and then planting it to human needs alone, creating those vast monocrops of wheat and corn and soy and whatever, that is the most destructive thing people have done to the planet. And that is not a death-free option. Um, There are not just dead animals, but entire species dead inside that food. And so, you know, that was the decision that I had to come to later, was which death was I going to participate in. And I choose the one that was the cycle because at least life gets to continue. But that's what it meant. You know, when I was actually just trying to grow vegetables, I had to understand that that those plants wanted animal products. There was no way to keep that soil healthy without it. So manure, blood, bone, you know, whatever forms it came in, that, that was what had to be added ultimately to keep the plants healthy. And then you can extend that out to all of nature and see that it's always that kind of cycle where the plants are eaten by animals and then the animals eat each other and ultimately the soil eats everyone and recycles you know every last molecule of carbon in my body in your body all of it is on loan and all of it will become incorporated into another living creature at some point in fact the thing that's really fascinating is that every single rock on the planet consists of molecules that were once part of living creatures and mm. every civil, single molecule right now that's in a living creature will once again become rock at some point and then get recycled back into being alive. So the rock itself is the, like the structure of the planet itself is part of this process. Life does not just exist in this tiny little green slice at the surface of the planet. It's the planet as a whole. It's either alive or it's not. And we are very lucky. Our planet is alive. But we need to understand how long those cycles are and what's involved because, you know, once again, there is no death-free option, okay? It's always just a process of recycling. So either we do that well or we do it poorly, but there's not actually any way out. Yeah, I just, I love that, that uh, plants eat animals as well. It's just, it's so, um, so brilliant. I just love it. So, uh, you know, I was, um, uh, one thing I think that people are overlooking in the studies supporting vegetarianism um, is that the use of uh, using factory farm meat uh, that they're fed GMO grains? And uh, what is the flaw in vilifying all meat based on studies like this? Well, the real flaw is that cows are not meant to eat corn, and if you feed them corn, even if it's organic corn, they're going to get sick. Okay, they need to have you know they have four different stomachs, so they're and the, the rumen has to be at a, at a neutral pH. And that's because they depend on bacteria. So what's actually happening inside a cow is really interesting because the cow eats the grass, but she doesn't actually eat the grass. She's feeding that grass to the bacteria inside her body. The bacteria are the ones that can actually break down the grass. 
and then she eats the bacteria. So it's this really brilliant thing where she takes very, very poor quality cellulose, you know, gets it inside her body by chewing and swallowing, and then the bacteria then break it down, and what she gets out of it is really high quality protein and fat from those dead bac- from the bacteria that she's then going to eat. And, you know, it, at, are you going to say that one of these people is exploiting the other? Well, I suppose you could try to see it as a top-down power relation, but honestly, it's symbiotic. The bacteria get a good home. Um, they get carried around inside the safe environment of the cow. Um, the cow gets fed. You know, everybody has their moment. They are all also going to die at the end of the day, you know, sooner or later. So the bacteria will feed the cow, then the cow will die and feed the grass, then the grass will feed another cow into more bacteria. This is what I mean about that cycle. So they're all dependent on each other. And, you know, as long as nothing disturbs that, it could go on for another 10 million years. The problem is that when you put corn inside that cow instead, now her rumen is way too acid because they're not meant to eat corn. You know, corn is not grass. It's very different. Um, so it's way too acid. And with that acid environment, a lot of the bacteria die because they need the neutral environment. So instead you get problems like E. coli because that's one of the bacteria that can survive that high acid environment. So the cows are really sick. Um, that They actually end up with holes in their stomachs from the high acid, uh, which means they get blood poisoning. Um, pretty much every single cow that goes to slaughter out of a, out of a, um, a feedlot has liver damage. Some of it's quite extreme which means that, of course, their whole system has gone toxic. They can only survive, you know, 60 days, maybe 90 days tops in a feedlot because they are so sickened by it. So that's what you're eating if you eat factory farmed meat is a really sick animal. And so the problem with using, you know, factory farmed meat as the baseline for health studies is that it's really sick stuff. So number one, you've got all the, you know, all the terrible toxins that are floating around, but it also changes the amino acid profile of the meat, and it completely changes the fatty acid profile of the meat. So it changes it into substances that humans, we've never eaten before. We've never eaten that, that kind of, that amino acid profile. Um, For instance, it's very low in tryptophan, and, you know, anybody who deals with depression knows tryptophan is the precursor to serotonin. And this is, I think, one of the reasons that we have this epidemic of depression right now um, across the United States is because of this, this factory farming, feeding them the corn. Corn is very low in tryptophan. And if you feed cows corn, um, their meat will be very low in tryptophan. So, And then you eat it and you think you're going to feel happy, but you're not getting enough tryptophan. So there is no way for your brain to produce the serotonin that it needs without that building block of tryptophan. So that's just one example of what happens to people who eat factory farmed meat. You're not getting the amino acids that you need. You're not getting... The, the fatty acids, and for the fatty acids, of course, it's the omega-3, omega-6 balance. So I don't know if you want me to get more technical on that, but feeding them corn, believe me, throws it way off. And this is responsible for everything from, you know, Alzheimer's to asthma to, um, you know, arthritis. It's the, the uh, two high omega-6s are, have been an absolute public health disaster in this country. And one of the main reasons, of course, is this, this grain feeding of cattle. So to use that as a baseline for these studies isn't really honest. I mean, if you want to prove that factory farming produces disease in people, sure, we can all agree to that. But that's not the only kind of meat that's out there. In fact, it's you know the worst possible thing. And, and on every level, I think most caring people are against it. So we, we're not really proving anything we don't already know. Yeah, I'm hoping one day we'll have some studies comparing factory farm meat to grass-fed organic meat. Uh, but the only study I've been able to find on grass-fed meat is a study with the Amish. <clears throat> so they've got really much lower cancer rates and disease rates than the general population. Um, but let's talk about the vegan diet a little bit. Um, when someone's vegan, there's nothing left to eat except for vegetables, fruits, nuts, and grains. And what is the problem with eating so many grains in the diet? Well, there's a few problems. Um, Number one is that, I mean, you can call it complex carbohydrate if you want, but it's really just a pile of sugar. Uh, Every single one of those so-called complex carbohydrates has to be broken down in your guts, and it will be, and absorbed as simple sugars because it's only the simplest molecules that are going to make it through the barrier of your intestines. And so it has to be really small, so your body breaks it down. And so meal after meal after meal, you're eating a pile of sugar, and you are going to wear out your insulin receptors. And this is one of the main complaints 
that a lot of us who are you know sort of recovering vegetarians and vegans have is that we destroyed our insulin receptors. Um, you know, we were well on our way to diabetes, and some of us made it all the way there. And that's what happens when you eat that much carbohydrate day after day after day. The human body was never designed to handle that load of sugar. So you're going to wear it down. Um, it, so eating that much sugar means that, you know, your pancreas has to produce a whole lot of insulin every time you eat a meal. And then the insulin locks onto what's called the insulin receptors on the surface of each cell and then tries to get that sugar out of your bloodstream as fast as it can and, you know, shove it into the cells as fast as it can. The reason being that your, especially your brain can only function um, in a very, sh- it's a very small range of blood sugar. If it's too much or too little, you can literally die, as any diabetic knows. So it's an emergency situation over and over, and it's three or four times a day you're doing this to yourself. It's so you've got this insulin rush, then you know, the, um, your body works as fast as it can to, to grab the sugar out of your bloodstream, throw it into the cells as fast as it can, and then for a lot of us we get a blood sugar crash because it's a very, very blunt mechanism. It is not a finely tuned mechanism. Now you've got too low blood sugar, and now you've got hypoglycemia, and you feel like you're going to die unless you put some more food in your mouth. By the time I was done being a vegan, I had to eat pretty much every 30 minutes not to feel like I was just going to fall over from the hypoglycemia. And this is what will happen to you if you keep on with a diet that's based on on carbohydrate. Um, Now, the excess insulin also creates all kinds of other problems, one of them being inflammation around the body. Um, This is why there's this concept of metabolic syndrome or syndrome X, there's a whole constellation of problems that people get from eating these diets that demand high insulin. So that's high, high heart disease, diabetes, the high blood pressure, um, and then of course that that you know center of the body obesity, the um, you know the belly fat. That is all created by um, these these high insulin diets, the high carbohydrate diets, um, and so it all comes as a picture. And so. That's like the, the main thing that's in excess. You've got a couple of other excess problems, one being the high omega-6s. Um, you, on, a, on a vegan diet, there really aren't any good sources of omega-3s, and you need both. Human beings cannot produce either. We need to eat both somehow in our diet, but they need to be a certain ratio. And there's some debate about whether that ratio is 2 to 1, is it 1 to 1. Anyway, it's, it's something fairly low, but if all you're eating is grain or grain-fed meat, your omega-6s are going to be like 20 to 1. I mean, it's completely out of balance. And that will just wreak havoc, especially on your brain, um, on your ability to keep a stable mood state. It creates inflammation everywhere. Omega-6s are responsible for inflammation, and omega-3s are responsible for calming inflammation. And you need some inflammation in your body. I mean, you, you absolutely need some to break down, you know, dead cells, um, to repair infections and damage, all that kind of stuff. You're going to need some inflammation, but you don't need too much. That's the problem. So that's why the omega-3s and omega-6s have to be in balance. So when you're eating, a, uh, plants have a lot of omega-6s. So when you're eating a grain-based diet, that's that's what you've got is way too many omega-6s. So you're going to have all these inflammatory problems all over your body. Your joints are going to ache. Um, you know, you're going to have weird pain that nobody can explain. I, I think a lot of the people who come back with diagnoses, you know, that are not terribly specific, um, that that's really what's going on is it's just, frankly, too too high omega-6s in their diets. Um, and if they were to eat a more paleolithic diet, you know, especially with grass-based animal products, you know, a lot of them find that it's it's immediately relieved, the pain is immediately relieved. And, and I certainly found that to be true. And it doesn't take much <laughs> for me falling off the wagon uh, to, to start to feel that level of pain again. So for some of us, it's very direct. I mean, if you do enough damage, you don't have a lot of leeway with this. Um, so that's the problems that are too many. Now you've got on the other side of the vegan diet the things you cannot get. So cholesterol. Cholesterol has been horribly demonized over the last 20 or 30 years, and there's really no reason for it. It's an incredibly life-giving substance. Every cell in your body requires cholesterol. It's like the balloon. It's like you know the the the, the basic structure of every cell is made out of cholesterol. So without cholesterol, you would literally be a liquid pile on the floor in about five seconds. Okay, you have no, to have cholesterol in your body. Your brain's 25 percent cholesterol. Or more than that, yeah. It's, you're, you, it's like you need cholesterol for just about everything. Um, the, the surfactant of the lungs, the very top layer of your lungs, is made out of 
you have to have saturated fat. You have to have some cholesterol for that to function because that's what it's made out of. Um, if you don't have enough, then you cannot do correct air exchanges. And this, I think, is one of the reasons that we have this tremendous epidemic of asthma among children. And I've seen this over and over again. Um, I know this is just anecdotal, but, you know, when children with asthma stop eating this grain-based diet and switch to appropriate animal products as the base of their diet, the asthma is gone in a week or two. I've seen it with adults as well. Um, and these are people who have been on inhalers for 20 years. And within six weeks of eating, you know, a more appropriate human diet, they can throw away their medication forever. And it's absolutely miraculous. Um, you know, also problems with the skin, like eczema, that as well can clear up almost overnight um, by eating and simply eating enough cholesterol. Um, so cl- cholesterol is also the mother hormone. Um, all of your, your hormones in your body are made from cholesterol. That's the basic building block. And that includes all your sex hormones. It's all your hormones. So you're not going to have, you know, the reproductive function that you might wish to have. You're certainly not going to have a sex drive, um, you know, eating those low-fat, plant-based, vegan-type diets. There's just no way for your body to produce appropriate sex hormones. And that's why so many vegan women, myself included, end up being, you know, with amenorrhea where we just we simply stop having, you know, regular fertility cycles. Um, yeah. That didn't take long for me. That took maybe three weeks of eating appropriate food. And I'm and I, in my story, it was like I I almost never menstruated for that 20 years that I was a vegan. And I so then I went sort of cold turkey and went back to eating, you know, a more appropriate diet. Within three weeks, I got my period, and um, I haven't missed one since. So in my case, it could not have been more. I mean, it was just absolutely direct. It, the, the evidence could not have been more profound. And it was really scary to me to think, what had I done to myself? You know, that's 20 years of this. Like, that's a lot of damage. Yeah, so, they conveniently don't mention this in any of the vegan books. No, they don't. And a lot of women end up heartbroken. You know, my sister had to have a hysterectomy because she was a vegan as well, did the same kind of damage, ended up with endometriosis. And a lot of that is the soy as well, which we can talk about. But, you know, mm-hmm. so she ended up having an organ removed because it was so bad there was nothing else they could do for her. So, you know, that's no fun. Uh, nobody wants to lose an organ. Um, but this is this is the path down which... You are treading um, if you decide to pursue this diet long term. So, okay, that's the cholesterol. Then there are some fat-soluble vitamins. Um, again, we cannot make these vitamins. They're essential because we have to eat them. So vitamin D, vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin K2, you just can't get them from plants. Plants don't need them, and they don't produce them. You've got to eat them. And without those vitamins, you know, your health will just degrade and degrade and degrade. You are on biological drawdown your body will cannibalize itself in search of those vitamins and it will limp along as best as it can but you're going to have health problems and eventually those problems will be permanent and that is the warning you know i I mean my life can really stand as you know a, a, a morality tale essentially to you know what will happen if you pursue this long term because that's what happened to me so those are the some of and then also there's minerals you know you're just not getting enough minerals um, and that's one reason that my discs fell apart in my spine, was simply the lack of minerals. And even if you are getting high minerals from somewhere, somehow, you're taking some kind of supplement, the problem with the grains is that, I mean, it's hard to, for a lot of people to accept this, but plants don't really want to be eaten either, and they have all kinds of ways to fight back. Now, they don't have teeth and claws the way animals do, and they can't run the way animals do, but what they've done is they've become incredibly good at chemical warfare, and that's how they fight back. So one of the the substances that, that seeds in particular produce is called uh, phytic acid or phytates. So when you consume them, what happens is the phytates bind with all the minerals in your digestive tract and just carry them out of your body. So, you know, it's the plant's way of saying, you can eat me if you want, but, you know, you're going to get sick and die ultimately, and you're not going to have healthy offspring. So, you know, we're putting it into this the best way that we can. And so that's what phytates do. So if you're eating this, this wonderful whole grain diet that we're all supposed to be eating, you don't realize what you're doing, but you're ingesting a whole bunch of anti-nutrients like phytates, and you're draining the minerals from your body every time you eat. And, we again, we are not told this. Um, we're just told to eat, you know, however many servings, you know, 50,000 servings of grain every day or whatever the hell the pyramid says, um, you know, way too many of these things. Um, there are ways around it. You can try to pre-treat those grains so that they're a little more edible, 
But these are traditional sort of food ways that we have completely lost in this country. So if you're just eating whole wheat or whole rice or, you know, brown rice, whatever, just straight out of the bag, um, again, you're not doing yourself any favors. And I um, would highly recommend looking into this further before you continue eating those kinds of things. Well, let's talk about soy a little bit. Um, soy is a, definitely a big part of most vegans' diet. And, you know, because we've been told by the food industry for over a decade that soy is healthy, so many people believe that this is, in fact, true. So what are your thoughts on soy? Soy is, um, it's very cynical, you know, what the marketers did with soy. There was actually a press, um, an internal memo that was, you can find online that was released to the public. And you've got these marketers saying, look, if we can position soy as, somehow connected to an upper-middle-class, healthy green lifestyle, people will buy it. Because up to that point, soy was kind of a joke. I mean, I remember in the 70s all the jokes about whether or not there was soy in McDonald's hamburgers or Burger King or whatever, that it was considered poverty food, it was considered, you know, like barely edible, that only people who were unintelligent or didn't have a choice would eat it. Okay, and they were able to turn that around using millions of dollars of marketing by buying ads in magazines like Yoga Journal or you know um, New Age Journal, um, the kinds of places where green groovy people would see these ads of you know healthy buoyant people riding their bikes and you know having beautiful middle class houses or whatever, and they were able to sell it as a lifestyle that that soy meant all of that that it meant green and it meant healthy and it meant wonderful, good, peaceful things. So everybody fell for it. The way that marketing works, you know, it's very manipulative stuff. So they were able to reposition soy as that. So now um, everybody believes that, you know, it cures heart disease and it won't cause cancer and it helps you with this and, you know, all these different health claims. One by one, all of those health claims have been disproved. Um, And, for instance, the American Heart Association took away its original endorsement of soy as something that was heart healthy because it just didn't hold up in the laboratory. And places like the Cornell, the cancer lab at Cornell, have come out very strongly and said, if you have a history of breast cancer in your family, do not ever eat this stuff. Um, Other researchers have said things like, these are drugs, not foods. I would never feed my children soy. Um, So there's a few problems with soy. One is the phytoestrogen content. So phytoestrogens look like estrogens, but they're not quite estrogens. So they look enough like estrogens that they will lock onto the estrogen receptors in your body. So they're taking the place of real estrogen, and your body can't use it quite the same way. So you're going to have this sort of cascading ill effect from not having the actual building blocks that you need to do all the functions that estrogen does. And this is one of the reasons why... You know, again, women who eat a lot of soy, and men as well, end up having all kinds of reproductive issues. Um, It's the phytoestrogens. If you are feeding soy formula to an infant, that is a hormone load that's equivalent to feeding them four birth control pills a day. Now, nobody in their right mind is going to put their infant child on four birth control pills a day. But if you're feeding your child soy, that is what you are doing. And I hope the parents who are listening I mean, I hate to scare you, but I hope you're getting a chill of horror down the back of your neck because it's horrible what's happening to children out there. We have this absolute epidemic of precocious puberty in girls particularly, and this is one of the reasons is because the amount of soy that is in just everyday foods. And then you add to that, you know, all the soy milk that has been sold to us as something healthy, and people are bringing this home instead of real milk. Even juice would be better, frankly, than soy because of the phytoestrogen content. And so now you've got these these little girls at age five, six, seven entering puberty. It's horrible what it does to their bodies. I mean, it's just a, a lifetime of suffering. Um, and it's particularly true for African American girls. It's way higher rates of precocious puberty. And one of the reasons is, if you're an African American woman who's on food stamps or WIC or food assistance, you cannot buy anything but soy for your baby. They won't let you buy milk-based uh, formula. You have to have soy without a doctor's note. And so 
by default, a lot of these women have been forced into it, and they may not even know what the problems are. They may know, but they don't really have a choice. I mean, when you're poor, you're stuck. And that's one of the reasons that it, it's particularly high amongst African-American girls. This is an experiment they are doing on the, the most poor and the most vulnerable in this country. And we need to be horrified by this. I mean, this is an experiment that the soy industry is doing on our public health. And that's who's paying the price. So I yeah, hope that people get outraged about awful. this because it's horrible. It's just horrible what's happening out there. So you got the phytoestrogens. All right, we got that one. Um, a couple more problems with soy. One is that soy is a known goitrogen. It does terrible things to your thyroid. And, of course, I sit here with my Hashimoto's disease um, thinking about all the soy that I've eaten <laughs> as a vegan, and look what I did. I ended it up with the autoimmune disease of the thyroid. You will also notice that Hashimoto is a Japanese name. Um, and we're always told, oh, in Asia they eat so much soy and aren't they healthy. First of all, it's a lie. They don't eat all that much soy, maybe two tablespoons a day. They don't eat it as a protein replacement, that's for sure. Uh, number two, yeah, they have tremendous thyroid problems in Asia where they eat soy at all. And that's why Hashimoto is a Japanese name, and that's the disease that I've got. So, again, don't let the marketers sell you on this one. It's not true. When they eat soy in Japan, it's eaten, it's heavily fermented, and that's for good reasons. Um, it will, when you ferment it, you actually do take out some of the anti-nutrients that are in soy. And then it's eaten with fish broth. And fish broth will do two things. It will replace some of the, the minerals that the soy is dragging out of your body. And it will also contain iodine, which will help support the, support the thyroid. So that is sort of you know insurance against the damage that the soy is doing. Now, how it is that traditional people figured all this out without microscopes I don't know, but it's pretty amazing that the only way they eat soy is with kind of the antidote to soy, um, and that's how it's eaten, and then they might put a little bit of tofu on top as a garnish, but they don't sit and eat these, you know, protein replacement, highly industrialized products, you know, as um, as a meal, as, as we are being encouraged to do. So that's the, the, uh, the thyroid thing, and then, again, we get to the anti-nutrients. Soy has a pile of anti-nutrients in them. So it has trypsin inhibitors. Trypsin is a digestive enzyme that you need. This is why when a lot of people eat soy, they end up with extreme intestinal distress. And I mean up to and including like bloody stools and bloody diarrhea. And they don't know what's going on. They don't know why. Um, and I've seen this over and over as well. Even, you know, some of my intimates have had problems with this. They take the soy milk out of their diets and within two days it's cleared up entirely. And, you know, this was one of the big you know, mystery, they've gone to the doctor over and over, big mystery, barium, you know, swallow the barium, do the big test. Nobody, what is this bloody diarrhea? Where is it coming from? And then, oh, it was the soy all along. So that's the trypsin. And then you also have, again, the, the high phytic acid content. So it's really hard to get enough minerals if you're eating soy. And that, again, especially zinc, um, you'll be at risk for all kinds of problems, body and brain. So um, soy is really not an appropriate food for humans. It's not really an appropriate food for any animals. They've seen the same problems with lab animals. They've seen some of the same problems with farm animals. Um, I would just leave soy alone entirely. Yeah, and definitely I've had problems with my own daughter. When I, I, was, when I was vegetarian, I was eating lots of tofu, and you now I started feeding it to my baby. But when she was about one years old, she started eating more solid food and I started feeding her, like, every day I gave her a little pile of tofu chunks, sometimes twice a day. And during that time, from one year to two-year-old, she did not progress developmentally. She was not progressing in her speech. And because it causes manganese toxicity, like young children, babies, don't have the blood-brain barrier to keep manganese out of their brain. And so it causes that toxicity, and I think there's a big problem with kids having developmental delays and lower IQs because of soy consumption. Um, it's but, a real you know, problem. Yeah. 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 So and my daughter now has to be in a special school to get her caught up <laughs> because in part, it's partly because of soy, and I, I just intuitively know that. Um, and definitely one thing is certain, by the time you feel or experience nutrient deficiencies on these diets, you know, they're typically quite severe, and e even then, many vegans, and even vegetarians for that matter, they still cling to their diet, and even going to their doctor, trying to figure out why they're having health issues, but never questioning their diet, and the problem is most doctors don't know anything about nutrition and won't attribute one's health problems to being vegan, so um, if the doctor even asks their patient about their diet at all, 
So, you know, I know several people that have had so many health issues and undergo test after test, but refuse to think that they're vegetarian or being in diet is at the root of their health issues. And what do you think about this? It's absolutely true what you're saying. I think the average doctor gets 20 minutes of nutritional training in med school, which obviously is nowhere near adequate. Um, I mean, it's a joke. I don't even know why they bother. So you're going to go to the doctor. You're going to present these problems. I mean, I I don't couldn't even count how many doctors I had been to when I was a vegan. Not a single one of them ever asked me about my diet. So, you know, the the people in charge of the profession don't even know it's a problem. So that's, you know, number one. And then number two, you know, when you take on these diets, it's so ideological, it's so intense that it's almost impossible to consider that the diet itself might not work. Um, I know how hard it was for me to have to face that. It was, again, one of the hardest things I ever did. And, you know, as my sister said, well, you wanted God to be a just God. And, you know, it seems like it should work. It seems like it's the answer to so many problems. So when your health starts to fail, it's like, how can this be possible? How can this peaceful, wonderful, nonviolent, animal-loving, earth-saving, you know, the second coming diet actually produce ill health, actually produce damage? This can't be true. Because if it's true, everything collapses, and I hate the universe. <laughs> this is pretty much what I was left with. Um, and it's just, you know, it, it, it's really hard to face reality, right? So, yes, this is a problem. And it's one of the reasons that I hope people can kind of pry their ideology a little bit loose from their the rational part of their brain and just try to open up a little to bigger information. Um, because when you do that, when you start to research the bigger information, you're going to find all the people whose health has collapsed on this diet. And bit by bit, you can start to understand, you know, with your specific health, health problems, what caused it. The answers are really all there. there are, I don't think there are any mysteries left. Everything that I did to myself was ultimately explained when I learned more about nutrition. Um, so I think that that's, that's, it takes a lot of research, and I know, you know, most people are short on time, but um, you know, if you're doing this to yourself and to your children, I, I think that it's it's well worth putting some more time in. Clearly, you care about your health. Um, it's worth asking those deeper questions and not getting stuck in any particular ideological box while you do that research. Because otherwise, it's just confirmation bias. We all do it. You know, we look for the answers that we want and that will keep us comfortable. But if your That's health is starting to fail, yeah, it's not going to work. So. You know, when I post a blog post on about meat on Facebook, <laughs> I get all the vegetarians in an uproar, and I, I hear so many people claim, you know, they're commenting on my post that they've been on a vegan diet for 10 or 15 years, and they're glowing with health, um, but I just have a hard time buying it, because it, it just goes against our human physiology and our nutrient requirements, like you said. But do you think that there are outliers that can experience optimum health on a vegan diet, or are they just merely surviving? Um, yeah, I think there's a few things going on. One is that they're on drawdown. So their bodies were built on appropriate animal products. They were not born vegan. They had good, solid bodies because their mothers ate meat and dairy and eggs, and then they were fed those things as children, and now they're drawing down. And that can last a good long time. You know, if you give the human body enough calories, it will limp along for a good long time. It will do the best that it can. But they're on drawdown. And eventually the rubber will hit the road. Um, it might be in five years. It might be in ten years. But um, it's there's just it, it can't be done. You know, there's too many nutrients missing. So that's one thing. Um, another thing is that some of them are lying. Um, pretty much everybody cheats, especially the vegans. The vegetarians, not so much. You're not so desperate for fat on the vegetarian diet. You're at least getting some appropriate fat, so some A and some vitamin D and all that. Um, so you're not as desperate. But as a vegan, I can guarantee you, you're starving every day and you feel it. Um, and you don't know what the problem is. And then every once in a while, you'll fall off and eat a piece of cheese or, you know, eat your mother's whatever, macaroni and cheese. Um, and, oh, my God, do you feel better for half an hour. <laughs> and then you feel like a terrible person, right, because I've done this terrible thing. I've oppressed the poor cows. And on top of that, I enjoyed it. What the hell is wrong with me? And this is, I, I mean, you know, the the dark night of the soul. I can't tell you how many nights I spent just unable to understand what was wrong with me. Why had I done that? And then why did it make me feel so good? 
to the point where I knew eventually I would do it again. Um, but it flew in the face of everything I thought I believed. So it, it just it doesn't make any sense. The cognitive dissonance is so extreme when you're a vegan for that reason. And I am somebody who, compared to most vegans, I cheated very little. I mean, I'm, I had a, a willpower that was, um, you know, almost a force of nature on its own. So I would go years without, you know, any kind of slip. But that's not true for most vegans. And then when I did slip, it was almost impossible to stop because, my God, your brain is so hungry. And it's like just this animal, the animal wants to live, you know, like your your brain, your biology is just like desperate for more. And that level of hunger, it's just, it's, I mean, it's almost indescribable because you don't look like you're starving, right? It's not like you just walked out of a concentration camp. So where is this hunger? Where is it coming from? And it's not emotional. I mean, when you're experiencing it, you know that it's not, this is not an emotional craving. It is just absolutely physical. But there's no explanation for it in the vegan world. I mean, now I know. I was starving. I needed that fat. But at the time, it's just it's this complete mystery. You don't know where it comes from, why it's happening to you. All you know is that you feel dramatically better after eating the cheese or whatever it was you slipped on. Um, and then the next day you make another solid resolution that you're never going to do it again. And you might go a few months or a few years, but eventually it comes you, you do it again. Um, and so it's this, just, and it's this terrible body-punishing, body-hating kind of cycle, too, which really plays into all the eating disorder stuff and this very, you know, sort of puritanical just hatred for our physical embodiment, you know, and for pleasure in food and for caring for our bodies, um, all of that gets wrapped up in there. So it gets very confusing for, for a lot of us, particularly for women, um, you know, living in this very, you know, the, the beauty standard that's just absolutely anorexic and how much the female body is hated in this culture. You know, and so many of us are recovering from eating disorders. So all of that, it just becomes this really complicated, um, very confusing mess um, especially at 3 o'clock in the morning when you've just eaten two tablespoons of sour cream and feel better and don't know why. Um, but anyway, those people are not telling the truth. And they will keep saying, I feel great, I feel great, until the very last day that they stop feeling great, um, because that's what I did. So I know. I know where their brains are at, and I, and I know the kind of ideological defenses that they've put up. But I have a tremendous amount of compassion because I know what is happening inside their bodies and it's just a matter of time. Yeah. Uh, do you think that vegetarians can be healthy? I think they've got a better shot at it, but again, it's still way too much carbohydrate and not good quality protein. And, you know, you need that protein. Every cell in your body is built from protein, from those amino acids. So it, it, it's you're going to fall apart in so many ways when you just don't have good basic protein three times a day. Your mood, you know, your muscles, your bones, just everything isn't going to work well. Your immune system um, is going to fall apart bit by bit. You can last longer as a vegetarian than you ever will as a vegan, but um, I think at the end of the day, you just have to face facts. And the thing about being a vegetarian, too, which is why I never did it, is that it it doesn't even make any sense, because in order to get the milk from the cow, you have to have a calf every year. And where that calf ends is, you know, as hamburger. Um, you, uh, you know, it's just do the math on it. A, a cow cannot have a calf every year and be sustainable on a farm. You're going to run out of space. And that's part of the cycle of a farm. You know, you have, especially the males, are totally excess. So they're slaughtered and they're eaten, and that's that's where you get meat from, and that's just part of life on a farm. It's the same with the chickens. You don't need all those roosters, so they're put in a stew pot. And, um, you know, that's, that's how it goes. Um, there's the extras. So you're not going to get eggs without having dead chickens, and you're not going to have milk without having some hamburger along with it. You can pretend and just eat the milk and the eggs and not know how a farm operates, but I think you're better off facing the facts and realizing that, you know, that, that there is meat at the end of it, whether you eat it or not. And so you're not, you know, it's, it doesn't really, if you think it through ethically, it doesn't really hold. And that's why I was never actually a vegetarian. I went right to vegan um, because it, I didn't see the point of being vegetarian. So, you know, not only is it not helping your health, but it, there's not really any fewer animal deaths involved in eating that way. So, yeah, I don't think the vegetarians are, I mean, they will last longer than the vegans, but I don't really think in the end that it holds together. Yeah, I think by the time they get to, you know, been a lifetime vegetarian and turn 50 or 60, they attribute all their health issues to just getting older. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, and you know, let's talk a little bit about you know the planet. And um, you know, many vegetarians defend their diet, claiming that raising animals for meat consumption is destroying the environment. And I, I think many don't understand the distinction between factory farms and grass-fed farms. Uh, can you explain this a little bit? Sure. And again, you know, the underlying values here are not at issue. So compassion and justice and you know, anything that questions human entitlement and, you know, the, the level of destruction of this culture, all that's good. And I think we can all sign up for that. That is not what's at issue here. The issue is how best to embody those values. So, and again, I think we can all agree that factory farming is just horrible on every level, and we all need to do what we can to stop it. Um, I don't think that, in fact, you know, you making your specific personal consumer choices really has much impact um, and so I think that's one of the limitations of vegan, vegan or, or vegetarianism is that they really do see that this is, you know, the the best strategy is simply to withdraw personally from these horrors. And I don't actually think that's effective. But um, setting that all that aside, okay, so you can take a piece of land that's, you know, maybe got 12, 15, 20 inches of rainfall. You can do a few things on that land. Um, you can take that land, you can clear every living thing off it. So I mean down to the bacteria, the plants, the animals, everybody, reptiles, birds, small mammals, all the plants, all the grasses that grow there. Now you've got bare soil that's baking in the sun. Um, you can plant your annual monocrop of choice, so corn or wheat or soy, um, and then you can take a whole bunch of that that you've just grown and feed it to a cow that's living in misery on a cement floor inside a sealed building. And, you know, at the end of that cycle, you will have some very sick meat from a very unhappy animal, and all of that traces back to a dead piece of ground. Okay. And all of it, of course, had to be produced by fossil fuel. The only way that you're going to grow that year after year is by applying essentially oil and gas, okay, to, to make the nitrogen fertilizer. So that's, you know, that's the factory farming model. Um, you can take the cow out of it and simply eat the wheat or the soy or whatever on your own as, as humans. The problem is that the land was still destroyed. So the plants and the animals will still remove, were still removed. The um, bacteria is still dead. So the, the ground, literally the soil, is coming to pieces every year that you do this because it's exposed. It has to be exposed to plant those giant seeds um, to get the wheat or the corn out of it. And every time you do that process, every time you put a plow to the soil, you're destroying that soil, you're degrading it. The only thing that protects and builds soil, of course, are perennial polycultures, so ultimately either forests or prairies, and that is nature's model. You have animals integrated into either grasslands or forests or you know, savannas or wetlands or whatever, but you know, basically forests or grasslands. Um, so when you destroy all that, what you are destroying is not just that entire ecosystem, of plants or trees or, or grasses, what you're also destroying is the soil itself, and soil is the basis of life on Earth. So this is not a plan with the future, and in fact, we have skinned the planet alive. This We've come to the end now. By 1950, the major grain-growing regions of the world were completely out of soil, and what we have been eating ever since is oil and gas from the so-called Green Revolution. So the scientists figured out how to make usable nitrogen using a very energy-intensive process out of the feedstocks of gas and oil, and they produce nitrogen every year, and that is what you are eating if you are eating grain. You're eating oil on a stalk. Okay? I don't see what is better about feeding that to humans rather than feeding it to cows. I mean, it's the same process in the end, and it's just as destructive. Okay? That, that the entire ecosystem has been destroyed, and the only thing that's keeping it going at this point is more fossil fuel. So to me, that's why this is a deeper question than just factory farming. It's agriculture itself, which is inherently destructive. And it's essentially carnivorous, and it's, it's eaten the planet alive. I mean, there's, there's no more soil left, and 98% of the old-growth forests are gone. 99% of the world's grasslands are gone. And they have been destroyed for agriculture, let's be quite clear. They've been completely um, you know, eviscerated so that human beings... And it's just a very small number of humans. I mean, it, agriculture started in seven places around the globe, but it's marched its way around. Um, so now the entire world has been turned into, as much of the land surface as possible has been turned into um, these annual monocrops. 
So that's the problem to me, is that ultimately that's that's the baseline destruction that we're looking at. And that's what's going to have to stop if this planet has any hope. So you have that one acre of land. You can destroy it in that way. You can grow a bunch of annual monocrops for a short period of time until the soil completely collapses. And you can either feed it to humans or to cows. It doesn't matter. The destruction is the same. We'll take that same acre of land and let's do something else with it. Let's leave it in the grasses that would like to grow there. Let's leave it in that complete biotic community that nature naturally produces. Now you've got a cow eating grass. Well, first of all, there's a whole bunch of other creatures that can live there too. You've got ground-dwelling birds. um, You've got small mammals. You've got even some larger mammals. If you do it correctly, you can even have some predators. Um, uh, You've got reptiles, snakes, whatever, little, you know, whoever's there. They get to live there. Not only that, but because you've got perennial grasses, they've got these very deep root systems um, the water table will stay intact because of the roots, the water, the rainfall that falls will actually be absorbed into the ground. Um, there's, so there's like little tiny channels that the roots make so that water can actually go down. It will restore the water table, and then when it's needed, the, those deep, these deeply rooted perennial grasses will pull the water back up and keep the entire community alive by doing that. And part of that community would be this ruminant, this cow, the bison, whoever it is that lives there. Um, And then she eats the grass, feeds it to her bacteria. Um, On grasslands in particular, ruminants are absolutely crucial because they're dry in the summer and all biological activity stops. There's not enough moisture. What keeps those nutrients cycling is the fact that inside that ruminant, the cow or the bison, there's bacteria. And they do that basic work of life. They break down that cellulose send it out the other end, and now life can continue because there's moisture and there's nutrients. Okay, and that's like the miracle of ruminants on grasslands is they keep it moving when there isn't enough moisture. So here you've got that same acre of ground. You've got life that continues season after season after season. You could come back in 10,000 years, and the only thing different would be more topsoil, which is to say more life. And our role in that is we're apex predators. So like wolves and bears and eagles, um, we eat the animals that eat the cellulose. We cannot eat cellulose directly, but the bison can and the cows can, and then our role is to eat them and keep their numbers in check, and then ultimately somebody eats us and we get returned to the soil as well. And that is how we lived for our first 4 million years on that uh, on this planet. We didn't destroy it. Um, it's only in the last 10,000 years that we've become these monsters. And the basic activity that turned us monstrous was agriculture because it is the destruction of the planet. So that's a lot to throw on your reader and your listeners, but if people are interested in, in understanding this deeper level, there are a lot of really great resources out there. I would highly recommend Richard Manning's work, for instance, his book Against the Grain. Um, another book is called Grasslands, and it's about exactly this, how agriculture has destroyed the world, what agriculture is. And they've got to understand this if they're going to understand what the destruction actually consists of and then what we're going to do about it. Because if our planet has any hope, we're going to have to repair what we've destroyed. And that means at the end of the day, we're going to have to give up agriculture. And that is a hard thing to say without people looking at you like you're crazy, but it could be done. And (laughs) I'm not actually sure we have a choice. It's really the only way we're going to get the carbon out of the air and back um, sequestered into the ground is through repairing the grasslands. So it's really the only hope our planet has. And that's the topic of your new book, isn't it? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. Prairies are amazing places. Um, they, you know, most of the, the biological activity actually happens underground where we can't see it. And it's just teeming with life under there. So the top of the, the surface of it may look like it's gone dormant because there's not a lot of rainfall, but underneath there's all this stuff still going on. And the plants are so deeply rooted that, you know, they can survive these long periods without rainfall. And that's really the difference between a prairie and a, and a, a forest. A forest has more rain. So um, you get trees, but when, there's no, when, the, when the rain dries up, you get savanna, so there's a little bit of a tree, and then you finally get into the real prairies, and that's when there's just simply isn't enough rainfall. Um, and, you know, I've already discussed how the ruminants play a really crucial role in keeping, keeping life moving. But my real take-home point with repairing the grasslands is that um, if we were to take even 75% of the world's destroyed grasslands, and let's be clear they've been destroyed by agriculture okay but if we were to let them come back let the grasslands come back which is what would happen if we simply got out of the way um it would only take about 15 years but we could sequester 
all of the carbon that's been released since the beginning of the industrial age. And that's an amazing thing. I mean, you've got all kinds of, you know, wacko scientists trying to figure out technological solutions to global warming involving sequestering carbon in deep caves under the earth and God knows what kind of industrial disasters are, you know, waiting to happen with that. But we don't need to do any of that. All we need to do is repair what we've destroyed, and the grasses will do it for us. And the reason they'll do it for us is because grasses are really good at one thing, and that is building soil. It's what they do. And the building block of that soil is carbon. So if we just let them come home again, okay, they've been removed from their homes. Let's be clear that agriculture is a war against the living world. But if we just let them come back, um, they will start doing their job again, which is to sequester carbon, to build soil. And that's all it would take, 15 years. In fact, if we could restore um, to prairie all of the trashed-out agricultural land essentially east of the Mississippi, within a year the United States could be sequestering carbon instead of emitting it. And that's with everybody still driving their SUVs, you know, from here to hell. Um, it it doesn't take long. That's that's what grasses do. They're they're amazing creatures, and you know that's that's their that's really their their best talent is is creating topsoil. So that's why I'm writing the book that I'm writing is because. I really want the people who care the, the most to understand what the damage is and what our best option is for restoring it. And this is actually not hard. We don't need a lot of technology. We just need ruminants and grass. And it's not too late to reverse this. Uh, what is the title of your new book? Well, I'm calling it a Prairie Manifesto, but I don't know. That's just a working title. Okay. <laughs> and what, is, what about the book that you wrote prior to that, that you co-authored? Oh, Deep Green Resistance? Yes, yes. Yeah, um, so I co-authored that with Derek Jensen and Eric McBay, and we are trying to explain to a, a broader audience what, what's what gone wrong and then some solutions about what we might do. Because as we see it, the planet is in crisis, and I think anyone who's even got half an eye open can see how bad things are. Um, every day, 200 species go extinct. That's pretty bad. And if you let yourself open to the horror of that, I mean, those 200 species, they're your kin. I mean, they're your brothers and your sisters. You know, it's all those animals, all those plants, its they're all part of that web of life. And it's so stupid because even if you don't care about them for their own sakes, we need them. I mean, I can't make oxygen to breathe. Only plants can do that for us. You know, there's all these biological functions that keep this planet alive, and we're just the icing on the cake. I mean, we're not needed in any way. We're not producers and we're not degraders. We're just consumers. And without them, it's it's all over. And that's what we're destroying every single day. So, yeah, the planet has reached a crisis, and there are tipping points that are being reached as we speak. So, you know, just for instance, as the polar ice caps melt, more and more of the land is exposed. And what that means is, you know, ice is very reflective of sunlight. So a lot of the, ice, the the sun, the warmth that hits the ice bounces back into space. But the moment that you have patches of ground exposed, it absorbs, okay? The, the, the dark ground absorbs the heat from the sun, and that means that it's even hotter now at the poles, which means that even more ice melts, which means even more dark ground is exposed, which means that it's hotter still. And these are these terrible cycles now around the world that the biologic, biologically the planet is now on, where it's just going to keep accelerating worse and worse and worse. So we want people to try to absorb the horror of this because I think a lot of us are still in denial. And I think we're in denial because it's really scary and it's overwhelming. And as individuals, we don't really know what we can do. Okay, so that's... That's number one. And then number two, what are the political systems? What are the human arrangements that have brought us to th this brink? Um, you know, there are scientists that are debating whether by the year 2050, you know, half the mammals may be extinct on this planet. That's in my lifetime. I mean, and half the mammals, I mean, elephants, polar bears, who are we talking about? Can we really picture a world without them? It just, just makes you want to lie down and weep. And there are some scientists debating whether by the year 2010, whether the planet is going to support life at all. Um, it may simply be too hot. I mean, it may have been, the 
climate change may, um, may be on such a runaway at this point that if we don't do something soon, it, it may reach that. You know, they talk about Venus as, you know, the the hallmark here, that we're going to end up, you know, somewhere in that range where it just simply is too hot for life to continue. There may be some thermophilic bacteria at the bottom of the ocean, the ocean vents that can survive that, but I'm not going to call that a victory. Anyway, so what are the political arrangements that have brought us to this brink? And one of them is this arrangement called civilization, and that is simply people living in concentrations high enough that they need the importation of resources. So it's cities. Okay, so if you think about a city, the food, the water, the energy have got to come from somewhere else. And that's because the city has used up its own resources, right? So there's nowhere to grow food, there's nowhere to hunt and gather, um, there's no trees left, you know, the water has to be piped in from somewhere. And what that means is that they have to go out and get it. Well, nobody else is going to willingly give up their land or their water or their soil or their trees. So this is why agricultural societies end up militarized, is because it's drawdown. They're always using up, you know, their trees and their water and their soil, and then they have to go out and get it, bring it back, which means they need soldiers. So this is the pattern around the world for the last 10,000 years. You've got this bloated power center. You can think of ancient Rome. That's, a, you know, an, an image that everybody can conjure up. And, of course, they conquered the whole region. Well, why did they do that? Because Rome couldn't support itself, because they were living in concentrations that were too high. And, you know, prior to Rome, you had the ancient Egyptians, you had the Phoenicians, the Mesopotamians. It's the, the pattern is the same. You've got that power center, and it's surrounded by conquered colonies. And then the whole thing collapses. So that's what's been going on for 10,000 years, and it's spread around the world now. Um, it used to be that civilizations, well, the, I mean, civilizations last as long as their topsoil, because that's ultimately what it all depends on is that agricultural activity. So anywhere from 800 to 2,000 years, but eventually they collapse. So we've managed to extend this by figuring out how to use fossil fuel. But, um, you know, the day is going to come when that oil and gas is simply too ex expensive to extract. And then where will we be? You know, it's going to be the same problem all over again. So we try to lay that out and explain it in ways that people can understand. I, I know that's a lot to kind of pack into a short interview. But anyway, so we go through a lot of that, uh, the different sort of overlapping systems of power that have created a great deal of injustice on the planet, human rights abuses, as well as this kind of environmental destruction. And then we put forward what we think some solutions would be. Um, none of them are easy, though. Um, I, there's not any way that we're going to consume our way out of this, so the idea that you might buy this instead of that is not really going to be adequate to face the level of crises and the level of institutional change that has to happen. But ultimately I hope that people will get politically involved because it's really the only hope we have is to take back a, a real democracy, um, so economic democracy, political democracy, uh, all of this is going to have to, uh, we're going to have to, you know, redo all of it. To, I mean, it's, the thing is that, you know, in order to save the planet, we also have to save human rights. I mean, that's the, that's actually the positive part of this, is that the only way any of this is going to happen is if um, we actually start to value the things that we should value, like justice, you know, like sustainability. So it's not just completely grim, but it is going to take some work, that's for sure. And all of the institutions right now that are in charge of our planet are all headed in the wrong direction. They're all just condensing power and wealth at the top of the pyramid and extracting it from the rest of us and from the rest of the planet. So, gosh, that was kind of a long answer, but that's what the book is about. No, I love it. I love it. It's just so well thought out, just so ama just such amazing information. Um, but well, I, I just have one more question to ask. Um, and I'm going to start asking this question to you know everyone that I interview. Uh, what do you think is the most pressing pressing health issue in our world today? Um, I would have to say global warming because 400,000 people have already died from it. And if anything kills every living being, that's what it's going to be. So if you care about anything, any living creature, children, dog, horse, garden, whatever it is you love, it's under assault. And right now, that is the biggest looming catastrophe um, that's coming down the pike. So, yeah, I mean, health in terms of life or death, it would have to be global warming. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. So where can someone find more info about you and what you're doing? What are you up to? Well, the the easy answer is, oh, just go to my website. But the reason that's kind of a joke is because I have a strange name. So you have to know how to spell my name. So it's L I E R R E is my first name. Lear Keith at Yahoo. Um, sorry, Lear Keith dot com is my my website. But you know, if you just type in vegetarian myth, which is the title of, of my book, 
you'll find me. There's only one person who wrote a book called that, so it might be easier just to, if you can't remember, if you're driving your car and you just can't remember Vegetarian Myth, you will find me. Um, yeah, you can go to my website and you can look at my books and you can listen to interviews and see me on YouTube and all that kind of good stuff. Um, that's probably the simplest thing. Now you have a pretty rigorous speaking schedule, too. I often do. Um, I was gone for weeks and weeks this summer, and it got, it got really exhausting. But I, I don't have anything really big set up now for a few months, which is good because I can just be home for a while. Well, Liara, thank you so much for being on the show. You know, I, I can't read, wait to read your new book, and it, it sounds really, really compelling. And I just want to thank you for the important work that you're doing Um, because I know it's an uphill battle and I know that you deal with a lot of mudslinging to get your message out there. So thank you for fighting this battle and to inform people about how to truly take control of their health and save the planet. Thank you so much. Well, you're really welcome, and I want to thank you back because it's so much work putting out a podcast, and it's kind of thankless. You know, it's not like you're getting paid. You know, people like you do this incredible work just because you care. And, you know, without you, I wouldn't have a platform to speak. So um, I really appreciate what you're doing. And I'm also really sorry to hear about your child's health problems. And I just wish you all the best in finding help and hoping that she's able to recover. Well, thank you. Yeah, she's doing really, really well. So I'm confident she'll she'll be better. I just uh, Thankfully, I just wasn't vegan when I was pregnant. <laughs> I ate meat and liver and yeah. eggs and caviar and all kinds of healthy things. So she's healthy in that Very regard. Good. But uh, but Sam, thank you so much for being on the show, and I thank definitely you. would love to have you on again as a guest. So it was amazing. So thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Okay. okay. And Bye. thank you all you listeners out there for tuning in to Live to 110 podcasts. Uh, please go leave a review on iTunes. You know if you enjoyed what you heard today, and um, you know it's going to increase my visibility on iTunes, and I would really appreciate it so much if you could go do that take two seconds and help me increase you know my visibility on itunes thank you so much